The letters seemed to come every day. They came in large waves, and if they were an ocean, he was the shore they were crashing into, carving deep into his being and eroding him away. Opening each one, he could feel the desperation pouring out of them. He could touch the terror painted into their words, see the horror they described, and hear the weeping. The letters came from governors, they came from politicians and sharecroppers, they came from black Americans, they came from white Republicans. Each described the nightmare that had fallen upon the South. Their authors pleaded for his helping hand, their horrific experiences written down in hope that the highest office would hear their cries. Quote, Colored men and women have been dragged from their homes at the dead hour of night and most cruelly and brutally scourged for the sole reason that they dared to exercise their own opinions upon political subjects, one Southern governor wrote. Another wrote, things look here very much as they did in 1860. In another letter, a woman in South Carolina described the terror her family endured. Quote, our nearest neighbor, a prominent Republican, now lies dead, murdered by a disguised ruffian band which attacked his house at midnight and a few nights since. His wife also was murdered, and a daughter is lying dangerously ill from a shot wound. We are in constant fear and terror. Our nights are sleepless. We are filled with anxiety and dismay. The nightmare these letters described had begun as a social club, a fraternal organization created by six Confederate veterans in the same year the Civil War had ended. But the group's scope quickly expanded into actively resisting Reconstruction and the movement toward equality for black Americans, using fear, intimidation, and violence, rapidly evolving into a terrorist paramilitary organization. Under the guise of lost cause euphemisms such as preserving law and order, they became responsible for thousands of deaths, terrorizing and murdering Republican Party leaders and black Americans, all in an effort to weaken and destroy their political power. As the election of 1868 neared, the election that would put the man now reading these letters into office and would be the first election black American men would vote in, violence swept the state of Georgia. Around 1,000 black Americans were murdered in Louisiana, and in Arkansas, over 2,000 people were killed. And the violence conducted by the group wasn't aimless. Though the Republican would win the presidential election, Democrats in those three states would take home decisive wins, the militants having effectively kept black Americans from the polls. By 1870, the Ku Klux Klan had extended its membership into nearly every southern county and the letters left no terror untouched. The governor of North Carolina wrote, bands of the armed men ride at night through various neighborhoods, whipping and maltreating peaceable citizens, hanging some, burning churches, and breaking up schools which have been established for the colored people. As the KKK began amping up its terror campaign, southern states, most held by Republican governments, were finding themselves powerless to convict Klansmen. No one wanted to testify against the Klan, sure to face deadly repercussions. Quote, I cannot get witnesses as all feel it is sure death to testify before the grand jury, one district attorney in Mississippi wrote. Five witnesses he had arranged in one prosecution were all murdered. With a letter swamping him, his suffocating anger matured into determination. He was a novice politician, naive and projecting his own integrity onto those around him and trusting people too much. At times, his tunnel vision and lack of interest in the wheeling and dealing of D.C. would halt his policy agenda. It would result in a scandal-ridden presidency. But for whatever he lacked in political skill, the war hero turned president made up for in combat. When it came to war, his life had been a masterclass and it was clear that war was what the Klan wanted. After campaigning on protecting the rights and lives of newly freed people in the South, and with no doubt to the reality that black Americans had all but handed him victory in 1868, President Ulysses S. Grant was ready to meet the moment. Grant spared no punches in describing the Klan's mission, quote, by force or terror to deprive colored citizens of the right to bear arms and of the right to a free ballot. 
to suppress schools in which colored children were taught, and to reduce the colored people to a condition closely akin to that of slavery. Grant persuaded Congress into establishing the Department of Justice. In the same week, he appointed Amos Ackerman as his Attorney General. Ackerman was an adopted son of the South, having practiced law in Georgia and even serving in the Confederacy in the Quartermaster Corps. But following the end of the war, his integrity led him to progressive stances, feeling that the South's take on states' rights was too extreme. He became a Republican and became an advocate for black Americans to have the ballot. He was a federal district attorney in Georgia and persecuted individuals under Reconstruction civil rights legislation. Needless to say, he was a man for the job, with a character that historian Ron Chernow calls honest and incorruptible. Pressing forward in perseverance, Grant was able to push Congress to pass the Enforcement Acts, a series of bills that gave the federal government power to prosecute private individuals for the first time in American history, particularly violators of the newly ratified 14th Amendment rights granted to citizens. The Third Enforcement Act, informally known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, outlawed several activities associated with the Klan, particularly groups of people banding together to infringe on a citizen's rights, another weapon to prosecute under. Armed with the power of the federal government, a new department full of lawyers, and the force of federal troops, Amos Ackerman's marching orders were clear. Lay waste to the Ku Klux Klan. And lay waste... Ackerman did. Within only one year, Amos Ackerman secured over 3,000 indictments of Klansmen and over 1,000 convictions. Quote, if you cannot convict, you can at least expose, and ultimately such exposures will make the community ashamed of shielding the crime. This was the direction that Ackerman gave his department. Some Klansmen agreed to less severe guilty plea deals, while others fled into hiding. Many flipped, turning on each other. By 1872, the power structure of the KKK collapsed, sending the terror group into virtual non-existence. The reduction of violence was felt across the South, and in the election of 1872, black Americans in the South voted in record numbers. But it wouldn't last. A devastating massacre in Colfax, Louisiana, carried out by white Democrats attempting to take over after a bitterly contested gubernatorial election, would lead to the convictions of paramilitary group leaders. The convictions were appealed to the Supreme Court, and in 1876, in the case of the United States v. Krukashank, the court ruled that the 14th Amendment only protects American citizens from the government, not from other private citizens. The convictions were overturned, the Enforcement Acts declared unconstitutional, and black Americans were left unshielded from terrorism. Though the Ku Klux Klan would be all but toothless, violence would continue with the formation of other terrorist groups, and the Klan itself would still exist in the margins. In the final year of Reconstruction, Alabama's most powerful political broker, a former brigadier general in the Confederate Army, and the chairman of the state's delegation for the Democratic Party, would become the Grand Dragon of the Alabama realm of the KKK, Edmund Pettus. In 1896, at the age of 75, Edmund Pettus ran for public office. Before passing away in 1907, he served two terms as a United States Senator. According to the Smithsonian Magazine, his campaign relied on, quote, his successes in organizing and popularizing the Alabama Klan and his virulent opposition to the constitutional amendments following the Civil War that elevated the formerly enslaved to the status of free citizens. Considered a hero in Selma, the town was erect a bridge in his honor, the same bridge that John Lewis and hundreds of others would spill their blood upon at the hands of Sheriff Jim Clark, his posse, and Alabama state troopers. Amos Ackerman had left the Southern Democratic Party because he felt their views on states' rights were too extreme. The idea that state governments and legislatures as a pure form of self-government can nullify the laws of an overreaching federal government has a long history. But what is the idea of states' rights exactly? What do those who claim it mean when they say it? And how has the evolution of the dominant political parties in the U.S. unfolded in such a way that something claimed by the Democratic Party of the 1800s is now claimed by the Republican Party of today? 
The history of racism in the U.S. is a long one, but to understand how it still operates today, we must look at it through the lens of political power and how violence, coded language, and the justification to upend democracy ensured that a freedom promised in ink and bought with blood was never fully delivered in practice. I'm Ty Wyckoff, and this is the Millennial's Guide to This Historic Moment.